What a jobs report from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. With equity futures just a little bit firmer to kick off Q2, the countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York, we begin with the big issue, the Fed under pressure. How high does the Fed have to hike? The jobs data this week is at CPI headline inflation. Data dependent is certainly the name of the game. The Fed will try to be data dependent. They go 50 in May. That's the new hike. The markets from a pricing standpoint suggest that there's a 50 basis point hike on the horizon. They're going to do 50 basis points. Why wouldn't they? This is really a Fed now that is in inflation fighting mode. Inflation is going to be absolutely insane for March. The Fed is very much keen on front loading these rate hikes. It has to hike until there's some kind of pain. The Fed is late. The Fed knows it's late. Call me when we get to 3% in inflation and then they'll stop. They do have to move pretty aggressively. Joining us now is Mike McKee down in D.C. Mike McKee, this one looks solid. This one is solid, John. Uh, we had a lot of hiring going on in the month of March as employers continue to try to staff up. 431,000 jobs were created or restored in the month of March. That compares with 750,000. That's the revised number. You can see uh, 95,000 added uh, to the numbers this time, which brings you to 526 uh, new jobs that we didn't know about last month. Interesting thing is you have to go back to last July to see a number that wasn't revised higher. So 431 may be only the starting point for the March numbers. Unemployment drops to 3.6 percent. A lot more people come into the labor force, and we see a lot more hiring than unemployment. The participation rate ticks up to 62.4 percent. The Fed wants to see that. Average hourly earnings tick up to 5.6 percent. The Fed does not want to see that. Where were the jobs? Leisure and hospitality, bartenders, waitresses, and people working at hotels coming back to work, 112,000. Not quite as many as last month, but when you look through this report, it's a lot of jobs created in a lot of different areas. So a broad report instead of just a couple areas. Professional and business services up 102,000. Those are the McKinsey's and Boston Consultings and the H&R Block Accountants, that sort of thing. Retail, 49,000. Manufacturing, 38,000. Now let's go back to, just before I leave you, John, and show you the problem for the Fed. When unemployment falls, we know wages rise. Historically, that's been the case. You can see the circle in the middle there. That was 1999 when we got down to 3.5% unemployment. You can see wages rose and inflation rose. But then go all the way over to the right-hand side. Look at where wages and inflation are now as unemployment gets back to the same level it was in 1999. What is the Fed going to do about that? Do they think it's unusual because of the pandemic? Uh, can they bring down the wage level and the inflation level fast enough that it doesn't get embedded in society? Mike McKee, thank you, sir. What a meeting we've got coming up at the Federal Reserve in early May. Joining us now is BlackRock Global Fixed Income CIO Rick Reader and a whole lot more over at BlackRock, too. Hey, Rick, just react to this one. Wow, it looks decent. Uh, wow, it looks decent. I mean, it, the, the data is really strong. By the way, people, when they first saw it, said the 430,000 or so jobs was a little below expectations. You know, what people have to start factoring in is there's just not enough people to come back into the workforce. So I was looking at the data this morning. There's 1.6 million people who are not in the workforce who were, if you go back a couple of years, when we were pretty close to full employment. And you've had this, what is that, that number, you've had about that number that have retired. So to bring people back in, it's going to be hard to see 500,000 jobs uh, in any of, the, any of these subsequent months. There's, there's 11 million jobs opening, job openings. It's a, you've got a labor market, there's just not enough people that can come back in. So you're going to start to see these numbers decline a little bit, but the unemployment rate, I think, is going to continue to decline. So. It's, uh, I mean, it's a white-hot labor market. There's no other way to describe it. Rick, is this as good as it gets? And where does it leave this Fed? I, so I think it's as good as it gets in, from a labor perspective. I think the economy is moderating. I think you're seeing, when you look at some of the retail sales numbers that have come across globally, look at H&M &M yesterday, you're starting to see some of the data come off. If you look at the housing market, boy, if anything was to suggest to you some form of stagflation, it would be in the housing market. So I think the economy 
and this is part of why the Fed's in the toughest position that maybe I've ever seen them, is, is the economy starting to moderate in a bunch of ways. If you can't find the labor, and if your input, if your wage costs are going up, your input costs are going up, then companies will start to pare back a bit because you're seeing the consumer back off of these levels. So is it as good as it? Yeah, I think I think so. And this is why I think the Fed's got a, got a tough job. And I think part of why I think it probably makes sense to get some 50s in when you've got an economy that's moderating. And I think they'll probably do that the next couple of meetings. I hear some 50s. Does that mean two? Or do you take the city yeah. view and go three, four? No, I think it's I think it's a uh, I think you're assuming an awful lot to say you're going to go past two. But listen, they're so far from neutral. They're so I mean, they're still in super easy, accommodative position that I think you got to assume that by the June meeting, you'll have gotten 100 basis points done. I don't think they're going to do an inter meeting, but it's not impossible. But boy, I would I would argue Listen, get off of this easy. I mean, think about it. last show we were just talking about QE was ending, <laughs> and if you think about, if you th if you think about, you know, you got to get off of, you know, closer off of the zero or close to zero where we are, and so I, I would. But then I think you got as we get into the summer, I think you've got to step back and look at what the data is doing. If anybody can tell me they know what's going to happen with the, with the Ukrainian situation, yep. what's going to happen with the Chinese growth situation, what's going to happen with European growth deceleration, these high prices, which tend to cure high prices as consumers pull back. Anyway, I think it's presumptuous at this point. Would you fade any of these moves in this bond market? We've added some weight to the no. front end big time. You say no, why? No, so the only thing I would do is we are, you know, people tend to focus on the flattening of the curve in the front end. They say, gosh, short end rates have moved higher. We actually like, we've been investing in that one to three part of the investment grade credit market. So if you look at returns this year in fixed income, I think the ag's, you know, after today, the ag's going to be down six and a half percent or so. Law, things like long corporates are down double digits. Um, things like long treasuries down double digits. You know, I actually like owning some, you know, you got to keep your interest rate exposure down. Like, even though the curve's flattening, there's a, there's a concept of duration. There's a concept of, gosh, I just want to keep my return. If I can carry, you know, well, you know, the, the short end of the ag, the aggregate index is down about two and a half percent this year. You know, down two and a half is better than everything else. It's down six to to twelve percent. So that's part of where we're quote unquote hiding for a bit of time. You know, get some yield, get some carry into the portfolio. And don't take too much interest rate risk. Listen, if we're going to get the next three months, you're going to get CPI prints that are going to show year on year CPI that's going to be eight ish percent. You know, that's not going to give people any comfort around, you know, a 10 year treasury that's at 240. So, anyway, we're keeping our interest rate exposure very, very moderate here. What about your credit exposure, Rick, specifically high yield credit? So, so Jonathan, actually, for the first time in a, in a number of months, We've started to add a little bit, and you know, if you get when you get high yield back a six percent, and you know, we were in we you know we like loans quite a bit because interest rates are rising. But you know, now when you get high yield back a six percent, you know, it's pretty interesting. By the way, you know, if you know, I always think the best valuation of the equity market is <clears throat> is you take the free cash flow the companies throw off relative to the cost of financing it, i.e., where the credit market is, and and for ten years equities have been too cheap. Equities are not too cheap anymore relative to where the cost of financing is, i.e. the high yield market, the investor grade market. So we've been adding a little bit, again, trying to manage the interest rate exposure. But we've been adding a little bit for the first time in a, in a while. As you're getting back to yield levels, you say, gosh, if you go over the last 10 years and say high yield, it, it sixes into the sevens. You know, that's not a bad place to capture some carry. But again, I, I still think you'd be patient. Help me understand what that means for the cash position, because you had raised the cash position. Have yeah. you maintained that at existing levels? Did you use some of that cash to go into high yield, or did you rotate out of equities? Uh, so, so cash is one of my favorite assets today, and it continues to be. I mean, you look at somebody put a report out today that said this is the worst performance. You can take the equity market, the debt market. I mean, this has been. I mean, you have negative returns across everything. Cash is a is a lovely asset. In that, in, that, in that environment. So we're still running a high level of cash. We've drawn it down a little bit, Jonathan, to your point, uh, recently to add a bit of this credit, a bit of, high, of investment grade, a bit of high yield, um, you know, still being cautious on EM, but maybe a tiny bit of EM in a, in a couple of places. But, and by the way, this is US and Europe. You know, I think some of the European credit markets have become interesting. So, you know, that being said, I, you know, I still think rates have some room to go, and uh, and so you know we're we're still being cautious around how much how much we're buying today and sitting in more cash. Can we finish on Europe? 
they just had a 7.5% CPI print, Rick. When I, mean, I watched that coming and just thought, wow, never mind the Federal Reserve winding down QE. The ECB is going to be doing QE through to Q3. They've got CPI running at 7.5%, a deposit rate of negative 50 basis points. And Rick, I'm just trying to get my head around how much repricing we need to do in a fixed income universe if Europe's on the path back to zero on a policy rate. So, Jonathan, I mean, think about how many years we were, we were on the show together and we talk about can Europe get a 1% inflation rate? Yep. Think about the number you just described. It's pretty extraordinary. And listen, I mean, you know, by the way, European growth over the next two or three years, we were just looking at numbers today. They, they could be on par. The way we, and we actually looked at estimates, economists' estimates. They show, for the first time that I think I've, I've ever seen this, European growth in the next three years on par with the U.S. My guess is there's some assumption you're going to see fiscal spend alongside of that in immigration, in defense, it's an infrastructure, climate, et cetera. So Europe could grow and uh, you know could grow nicely for the next couple of years and you've got an inflation dynamic meaning we have some more to go in europe i would i would argue from a rate perspective you know thank thank goodness we're out of the negative interest rate scheme which as you know i think is crazy to start yeah. with and uh and but i do think that uh, i do think we've got we've got some ways to go listen i think interest rates in our particularly in the u.s the demographic and the demand you know why why are rates still where they are you know, global demand for yielding assets for income is still pretty high. But, you know, if you said to me, pick which side they're going, I still think we'd get, particularly in Europe, I think rates have a bit more to go. Rick, just finally from me, we have been talking for a long, long time. It does go back years. I see that the Total Return Fund won the Lipper Award for the best core bond fund over 10 years. I wanted to congratulate you and give you the opportunity as well just to talk about your team. Because, of course, it's not just about you. It's a team effort, a big team behind you over at BlackRock. So uh, you're very kind to mention that. And by the way, Bob Miller is who I know you have on the show a lot. is an extraordinary driver of that of that fund. And Dave Rogel, and it's it, you know you know we're, we were I mean it's a huge honor. I mean uh, you know it's one thing if you pick it right for a month or so, but you know Bob and, and Dave and uh, and you know I think as a team it's been a been a pretty good uh, pretty good effort. So uh, you're very kind to, to bring that up. And uh, so anyway, I will say you know that was that was what has happened. Yeah. And uh, there's no less work applied today <laughs> to trying to figure out the environmental conditions to operate within uh, in these markets. Hey Rick, here's to another 10 years. My best to you and the team. Oh, thanks, we appreciate sir. it. Good friend thanks, of this sir. program. Looking forward to years still to come. BlackRock's Rick Reader there on his effort at the moment. Futures are positive by a quarter of 1% on the S&P, a really decent jobs report behind us with some movers. Here's Abby. John, well, a piece of that strength, not surprisingly, is coming from the banks on that strong uh, jobs report. Yields popping sharply higher, especially that two-year yield. And despite the fact that the two tens are inverted, as you've been talking about, banks, Wells Fargo, up more than 1%, not killing the tech sector, Amazon, off of its highs, but still up four tenths of 1%, uh, even though rising yields, as you know, could call into question valuation. Speaking of higher, China tech, take a look at Alibaba up 7.1 percent. This, of course, as China is considering giving U.S. full access to audits that would, of course, provide more transparency to these companies and to perhaps take away the uninvestable question. And then finally, maybe as a barometer of risk sentiment, GameStop meme mania up 14 percent. Stock futures may be up modestly, but these meme stocks continue to go. Perhaps we'll see the indexes follow, John. Abby, thank you. Coming up on the program, President Biden ordering a record release of U.S. oil. It's time to deliver true long-term energy independence in America once and for all. And I'm going to continue to use every tool at my disposal to protect you from Putin's price hike. That conversation, up next. Today, I'm authorizing the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months, over 180 million barrels for the strategic from the, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. This is a wartime bridge to increase oil supply until production ramps up later this year. President Biden tapping U.S. oil reserves in hopes of cutting gas prices, Russia demanding payments in rubles, but Putin easing disruption fears, saying the following, we have complied and will comply in the future with obligations under all contracts, including gas contracts. We will continue to supply gas in the volumes and at the prices set in current long-term agreements. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo and Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in D.C. Maria, let's start with you. 
Have we settled this one yet? Has it been sorted out on the gas prices, rubles, euros, dollars, what? Well, you want to sort it, I want to sort it, and this has been a perennial question now for a week. And look, we now start to get some idea, we have some idea of what this is going to look like. What the Russians say is we're not going to cut the flows into Europe. We're going to continue to honor contracts. We know that Gazprom, by the way, has never been in breach of contract, not even in the run-up to the invasion of Ukraine. But he says what's going to change is that from today, there will be a ruble bank account. So the impression that we get is that European companies will send the money in euros and Gazprom Bank remember this is the one financial institution that has not been sanctioned will then create two accounts for its clients one to cash on the payments in euros the other one would make allegedly that conversion into rubles so there's two things to keep in mind here one of course is that Russia still gets the money from the gas Europe continues to buy this gas and then secondly the impression that I get is for as long as Gazprom is not sanctioned there won't be anything that looks like an energy oil embargo it is very clear that the Europeans want to keep that financial line going and what we're seeing here is a lot of political grandstanding but in the end not a lot will change the swap will be done presumably internally by the Russian Federation Maria that's the situation in Europe AMH let's talk about the situation in the United States and welcome back we've missed you have we settled this effort by the president how well received has it been will it make a difference well, it does seem to be making a little bit of difference when you look at what's going on right now in the spot prices, right, Jonathan? When you have WTI off some 7% when this was announced. Uh, the issue really is, and I know you spoke to the special envoy for energy security, Amos Hochstein, is will this really bridge a gap and then will drillers want to come back and actually want to produce more? That is domestic U.S. drillers. And the president really went after them yesterday asking Congress to charge fees to these firms that have unused drilling leases on federal lands. So you could see a little bit of the tension, but we should notice, Jonathan, this is a massive drawdown in the SBR. It is absolutely historic, a million barrels a day for six months. Potentially, though, is this going to be enough, this six-month gap? Is this going to month? They say this is a wartime effort, and then domestic energy players will step in. AMH, thank you. We'll catch up with you a little bit later. Maria Tadeo from Budapest for the election over in Hungary this weekend. Joining us now is iCapital's Anastasia Amoroso, P. Jim's Mike Collins. Anastasia, first to you. RBC's Laurie Cavasina this morning said it's time to ease up on energy. Not outright bearish, but time to ease up on energy. Do you agree? I don't fully agree with that, uh, Jonathan. And I think energy really remains one of the better geopolitical risk hedges that we have. And if you think about oil prices, they have already eased up from some of the worst case scenarios. But I don't know if we fully ruled out the worst case scenarios from, let's say, the uh, the output from Russia, what if that's completely curtailed? I think the market is considering that we're still going to be receiving some volumes from Russia, but something like 70 or 80 percent of the volumes that are currently being exported, they're looking for a new home longer term. So I think that is still one of the better geopolitical risk hedges. Now, energy stocks have done phenomenally well, but in this environment, you know, with oil prices still continue to be at $100 a barrel, and I think that's plus, and that's our expectation for the remainder of the year, these oil companies are going to be making very significant cash flow. And by the way, when I think about the current environment, you want to be in higher quality stocks, you want to be in dividend producing stocks, and that's actually what you find in the energy sector right now. Mike Collins, that's the answer from an equity perspective. Can you give us the credit view? Yeah, so Jonathan, we've been overweight generally, the energy sector, including a lot of the pipelines, right, which are really the critical infrastructure to move the gas and oil around. And now we're exporting more and more of our energy, especially this liquefied natural gas to Europe. So, so that infrastructure is really uh, critical. I think we're just in the beginning stages now, Jonathan, of an increase in capital investment, an increase in production in energy in the U.S., right? What we've seen in the, in the oil curve is, yeah, the front end contracts are coming down, but the, the curve is, is more evenly balanced. So that's actually incentivizing oil companies uh, now to produce a little bit more. So it's actually a really good environment for energy credit investors because it just means more cash flow for, for more years to come. Mike, where do you stand on credit risk more broadly? A lot of people have still been quite comfortable with that. Looking at the numbers from payrolls this morning, the jobs data looks fantastic. The American economy for many people looks robust, resilient. Do you fear the slowdown in the back half that some people do? Uh, absolutely. You know, Jonathan, the economy is red hot. The labor market is red hot. Uh, but all of those things always occur 
right before a slowdown, right? You get a flat curve, you get a really low unemployment rate. In fact, that's actually a, one of the best leading indicators of future slowdowns is a really low unemployment rate. You get really hot economies and we are there, right? But I think we're just at the tipping point now, Jonathan, where we're going to see these this inflation start to uh, uh, generate demand destruction, right? So I really think the second half of the year could be a lot weaker. And I worry about this first quarter earnings season, which you know begins in the next week or so. I think you're going to see more profit warnings, more profit margin warnings, uh, more uncertainty. A company's inability to pass through those costs. At Goldman, David Costin talking about the same thing this week. Anastasia, we've got some more time around the open and bound, but just briefly, your view on the data and whether you share those fears that Mike has. I would. I mean, we shouldn't ignore the data. And I think Mike is absolutely right that it's not just the yield curve that's really sending some uh, red uh, warning flags here. I think it's the fact that uh, wage growth is not keeping up with inflation. You've got negative real wage uh, that's coming through and it's biting the consumer. And speaking of the oil markets, we're already seeing a slowdown in some of the oil demand this year where seasonally it should be picking up. So I do have the same concerns about the data. I don't think the slowdown is imminent, but it should definitely be watched. Anastasia Amoroso sticking with us alongside Mike Collins. The data, absolutely stunning this morning. Fantastic. Slight miss on a headline number, but everywhere else. Unemployment much lower than anticipated. Year-over-year -year wages looking decent. And the move in the bond market up 11 basis points on a two-year this morning. Your two-year, 244. And your 10-year right now, higher by nine basis points to 243. Coming up, the morning calls. And later, it's day one of Q2. Equities coming off their biggest quarterly decline since the pandemic. That conversation just around the corner. The jobs report in America looks rock solid. About five minutes away from the opening bound, equities are doing okay, up a third of 1%. That's the equity story. Here's the bond market picture. Twos, tens and thirties. You'll notice the two-year yield this morning trading above the 10-year yield. Post payroll so much of the last hour. Right now, no different. 243 versus 242. Some curve inversion. That's the price action. Let's get you to your morning calls. We can kick things off with Citigroup upgrading Win Resorts to buy, expecting pent up demand to drive a swift recovery in gaming throughout Macau. Your second call from Bed, downgrading Walgreens to neutral, seeing little upside amid weakening demand for COVID related items. And finally, Goldman, downgrading Dow to neutral, highlighting the stock's recent outperformance and growing headwinds. That stock is negative 1.9% at 49. 25. Coming up, looking ahead to Q2 after stocks record their first quarterly loss since 2020. I had to check that a few times. I can't believe that. The first quarterly loss going all the way back to the pandemic. Your opening bout to kick off Q2 is just around the corner. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Leaving behind a quarterly loss this morning, and good morning to you, with a monthly gain right at the end of the first quarter. And kicking off Q2, with futures up a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up two tenths of 1%, off the back of a really decent payrolls report in America. There's the opening bell, switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields are higher, much, much higher, on a 10-year by 10 basis points to 244, on a two-year by a little bit more, and some curve inversion through much of this morning following that payrolls report. In the FX market, the dollar stronger euro weaker, euro dollar down to 110.44, off by two tenths of 1% and crude lower again. A 99 handle, 99.17 and down a little more than one full percentage point. That is some of the cross asset price action about 20 seconds into this session. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, let's start out with that bond story. Those yields soaring, backing up, really helping out the banks. In particular, right now, we have the likes of Bank of America up more than 1%. Wells Fargo, too. So the banks are really enjoying the fact that yields are higher. Not hitting tech too much at this point. NVIDIA holding in there up about three tenths of 1%. China Tech really soaring. Baidu up 8.5%. This, of course, is China is considering giving the U.S. full access to audits, which would create more transparency into those companies. And then GameStop, we took a look at that earlier, soaring up 11 percent. It's not just the risk on mood. It's also the fact, John, as you know, that they are proposing their first stock split in more than 15 years. Abby.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking at this bond market move up 11 basis points on a two year to 244 on a 10 year up by 10 basis points. The two year up just a little bit more. So we've still got just a little bit of curve inversion through much of this morning. Then it turns positive just a little bit. Let's just call it zero. So I stop wasting my time and going over this again and again and again over the next few minutes as we chop back and forth above zero, beneath zero and look ahead to Q2. Coming off the back of the first quarterly decline since the onset of the pandemic. It has been that long. It's been two years. Looking at this, here's Candy Lines. Yeah, John, that quarterly decline for the S&P was about 5%. I guess the good news is it could have been worse because that was well off the lows we saw this quarter as we saw that late March rally. And actually, 5% losses on the S&P 500 as well as on high-yield credit in the U.S. are kind of the best you could hope for in terms of fixed income and equities. Uh, when it comes to U.S. assets, Treasuries, of course, saw their worst quarter on record, 5.6 percent decline. And for investment grade credit, they were down 7.8. When you put all the four of those categories together, it was the worst return collectively since 1980. Of course, I left one thing out there, John, and that would be commodities. That was probably the best place to have your money. A hedge against inflation, seeing commodities rising across the board, 20 percent for the ags, 23 percent for the metals. And of course, when you combine oil and gas, broader energy up about 47 percent. That's all the backwards look, John, when it comes to the forward look and I'll focus on equities here and look at history. This was just the ninth time since the year 2000 that the S&P opened the year with a first quarter loss of the prior eight years that happened. Six of them actually saw rallies in the second quarter, gaining an average of a little more than 5%. So that could be a good signal. But the caveat here is in four of those years, the index still ended down on the year, John. Kaylee, thank you. Some important stats there. Back with us, Anastasia Amoroso, Mike Collins. Mike, I want to build up on something you said about earnings for the year ahead. And it echoed something that David Costner Goldman Sachs said to us a little bit earlier this week. This is what he wrote. There's going to be a significant number of negative earnings surprises. In fact, you'll probably get a large number of pre-announcements in the coming weeks just before the earnings season. Can you weigh in on that, Mike, and where you think some of this is going to be concentrated? Yeah, well, it's, it's really a function, uh, Jonathan, of the fact that something has to give, right? Either prices have to come down or demand has to come down or both, right? And I would guess by the end of the year, both are probably coming down. But companies are, are just getting to the point, this inflection point, where they're going to really have difficulty continuing to pass through these higher input costs. Right. So they either stop producing stuff or they eat it in terms of profit margin. And I think it's going to be pretty widespread, but it's really the consumer discretionary side. Right. If people are spending all their money on oil and gas and cars and and food, they're not going to be able to spend money on discretionary items. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of pushback from consumers in, in those areas. Anastasia, are you expecting the same pushback? Uh, I am. In fact, if you look at one of the surveys uh, that tells you what the small businesses are doing in terms of price increases and what the expectations are, they're still raising prices today. But in the next three months, they're not expecting to raise prices to the same extent as they have before. So I think that's exactly right, is between slowing wage growth for the consumer and you know inflation that's starting to bite and the companies that are not able to raise those prices as they have done before, I think that is going to produce a margin squeeze for some of the consumers consumer staples and so for some of the consumer discretionary companies. And broadly, I also agree with Mike that I think we're going to be in this period where we're going to see slower economic growth. We're going to see Fed rate hikes and all in this is going to lead to an earnings downgrade cycle. We've already seen this, by the way. Again, if you look at the global earnings revisions ratio, it is dipped negative, And that usually doesn't flip back around very quickly. It usually lasts for a period of time. So I think that's going to be the story for the rest of the year. But I will come back to Q2 specifically. And I actually share the sentiment that we maybe are in for a better Q2 that we've seen in Q1 because we're going to see some of the reversals of the trends from Q1. But on earnings in particular, Mike is right. We have seen a big, a great number of negative earnings per announcements, the, the greatest numbers since I, I think the fourth quarter before the pandemic or you know, 2020. So with that, maybe for this particular quarter, a lot of that negativity is starting to be priced in and we're entering a seasonally strong period for the markets. So I probably wouldn't fade this rally just yet. What would you do at the index level, Anastasia? This is the first time that you and I have talked in quite a while where you don't sound as constructive on the story at the moment. X Energy. What would you do with the index story? 
Yeah, well, I think that's right, John. If you take a step back, if you look at what the S&P has done since even before the pandemic or since the depth of pandemic, this has been a very strong rebound in the markets. But if you look at all the headwinds that are building, I'm not saying they're imminent, but I think we're in this environment where it's just not easy anymore. You don't have an easy Fed and to, to propel the markets, and we have to contend with this growth slowdown. So I think we're going to be in an environment where we're going to have these periodic growth scares. I do think that it's too early to leave the market party, so to speak, because we know that the markets don't peak until months after the yield curve inversion. So you want to stay in this trade, but you probably want to de-risk it in certain ways. And so maybe that's a way to give up some upside and give yourself, you know, through the options market, some protection on the downside. That's one way to think about kind of moderating some of your risk on exposure. But then on the index level, yes, I would stick with the energy trade. I actually do like the tech trade. A lot of people flee that just because the Fed is raising rates. But when we are going to a growth slowdown, you want things that have the highest margins and the stickiest margins. And that's actually the tech sector and software in particular. So you barbell that with some of the higher dividend pay, dividend payers. Um, Rick Reader likes cash. I think there's definitely a place <laughs> for that uh, in the portfolio. And I think Rick also made a good point is, with rates rising and credit spreads widening, that does start to change the dynamic for what investors want to do. So I think some value is also starting to emerge in the bond market as well. So this is the equity story and the earnings risk around the equity story. I wonder whether real rates will be a supporting factor in the years still to come. City's Robert Bucklin thinks so. He wrote this, he said the following, negative US real yield should prop up global equity valuations despite intense geopolitical conflict GDP cuts, EPS downgrades, runaway inflation, monetary tightening, positive real rates potentially coming into 2023 would make us less inclined to buy the dips. So the real rate story for him doesn't change until 23. Now, Mike, that's your world. Mike, what's going to happen with real rates through this year into next year? How are you positioned for that story? Yeah, Jonathan, I think they basically stay negative uh, for most of the rest of our lives. Right? I think a negative you know, zero to 1% real rate is, is actually normal in a world of tremendous demand, uh, tremendous excess savings, tremendous demand for yield, aging populations. You're supposed to pay to store your money in short-term risk-free assets, like you pay to store everything else, right? So this, the one thing that could happen is the Fed could overhike, which is very likely, and probably our, our base case, as inflation's falling, right? And then they'll have to chase it. So maybe get a short period of, of positive real rates, but. I think the Fed will have to chase their tail and end up cutting in, in the years to come. Mike, walk me through this then. So as this program is playing out and you're watching these prices of bonds down, yields up, are you itching to get back to the desk and buy them? Uh, yeah, so we, we were actually really, got, got pretty negative on duration earlier this year when we saw some of these really brutally broad CPI prints, uh, Jonathan, and, and a real hawkish tilt to the Fed. Uh, but in just in the, in the last week or so, we've, we've kind of covered that and gotten more uh, flat duration. What people don't realize is when the curve is really flat, like it is now, what, what the average investor, especially retail investors, want to do, Jonathan, is move into the front end of the curve, go into cash or two-year, because they think, wow, I'm getting the same ex-ante yield. Why would I take more risk? But the actual trade to do, Jonathan, in a flat curve environment is move out on the curve, add duration, because ultimately that flat curve will result in a steeper curve and you'll get paid to earn duration. I mean, in three and four and five years from now, Jonathan, I still think the funds rate is going to be coming back down and long rates are probably going to be lower than they are today. So there is already a lot of embedded value out on the curve. Mike, every time we get a sell off like this one, it introduces a conversation about whether the 40 year downtrend in Treasury yields to the rally in bo the bond market over multiple decades is over. What's the ultimate pushback to that from you? You know, we're right at the top. I was just looking at it this morning. I've been following this trend for my entire three decade career, Jonathan, and we've always stayed within that band. And right now we're right at the top of, of that band. And, and we're seeing a lot of us at a big pension conference this week. And a lot of pension funds are looking at these bond yields, like Anastasia talked about, relative to the potential returns on stocks and saying, hey, this is a good time to rebalance. 
to sell equities here and go into bonds at much higher yields, much higher expected returns. We obviously see a lot of international demand. Uh, so I think there is a, a lot of pushback. As people get older, they need to rebalance and have more fixed income. So I think we're getting close to the high end of the range here. I'm going to come back to this conversation in just a moment. Anastasia Amoroso, Mike Collins, sticking with us about 10 minutes into the session. Equities this morning on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows on the S&P. We are a little bit positive, up two tenths of 1%. Coming up, the war in Ukraine jeopardizing the economic recovery. I really believe we are underestimating the medium term impact of this war. That's coming up shortly. Plus, we'll catch up with the White House, the US Labor Secretary Marty Walsh on the payrolls report. Most companies have actually said that they believe what we did yesterday was exactly the right thing to do uh, and that they feel that it has an incentive because uh, it is for six months before their production comes online and because we're going to spend the next couple of years replenishing the reserve that means that they are incentivized to continue to spend the capex that they've announced to increase production Amos Hochstein there of the Biden administration joining us a few hours ago on the crude situation. AMH joins us now down in D.C. Anne-Marie, a lot of pushback to this. Amos saying that some people in the old patch are happy with it. Some really strong words from the president yesterday, and I'll run through them again and share them with our audience. Companies have an obligation that goes beyond just the shareholders, their customers, their communities, their country. No American company should take advantage of a pandemic or Putin to enrich themselves at the expense of American families. Anne-Marie, that's some strong stuff. It is strong. And I think, Jonathan, there's really two points to make here. One is that it's a complete 180 for this administration, a third drawdown from the SPR. This was a president who campaigned to make climate a pivotal uh, sector of his, his entire campaign and wanted it to be part of his presidency. And in the second half, you do have a war that is going on. And obviously, Russia is such a massive commodity producer, especially in the oil and gas world. And that is adding a premium to the price. And the issue this administration has is it's just a shoot, shoot, too short of many months, Jonathan, until we get to November. And those gasoline prices are going to hit hard. Consumers at the pump, but also what Amo said in that interview is it's not just farm to table, it's farm to truck to table. The oil prices increases everything along the supply chain, and that is just in, uh, hurting consumers. One conversation we had, Anne-Marie, and I'd love your views on this, this talking point of the administration, and it is that, a talking point, of the amount of leases that some of these oil companies are sitting on, the way it's framed often is as if they're sitting on this really productive land with this very, very cheap oil that they can just get hold of and sell into the market. It's really not that simple at all. Why do they keep bringing this up? Well, it's not simple, right? And, and Amos was fair about that. He said that not all the time you're going to have a very productive well and you have to do a lot of digging, geology, seismic testing to make sure there actually is profitable oil in these wells to to use them. On the other side, the administration thinks that if you're just holding on to these leases and you're not using them, then you should have to pay a fee. Why should you just sit on them? Either use it or lose it. And potentially, Jonathan, this might actually get some steam in Congress. And that's what the president was calling on yesterday. But it is a talking point for the administration because 9,000 sounds like a lot. The issue is, until you find out exactly how much oil are in those wells, it's going to be much less. Anne-Marie, thank you. AMH, it's a nuanced debate. And I look to add yes. a little bit more value to it, and I know you do too, and the administration in the coming weeks, months, and let's hope it's not years we're talking about this. Some breaking data just crossing a wire. It's Mike McKee breaking through it, breaking through all of it down in D.C. Mike, put it together for us. Awful lot of news, John. We've been talking about the fact that March was the month when the war started, and we're seeing some results in the United States. Better manufacturing news from the S&P Global, which used to be the market uh, ISM numbers, PMI numbers, 58.8. Now, that's the final number. The preliminary was 58.5, so it went up at the end of the month. Not the same in Europe. You can see there that the PMIs there went down across the board as the month went on and as the war started uh, raging, then uh, the big problem for the Europeans is inflation. 
The uh, European uh, CPI comes in at 7.5%. That is the highest ever, basically, for the Eurozone. And it's something they're going to have to really uh, work on. The ECB's got a tough job ahead of it. Uh, and before I let you go, John, one more thing to note. That's the Chinese PMI, the Kaijin, came in uh, below 50, joined the state uh, PMIs below 50, suggests some contraction in the Chinese economy, not good for the overall global economy. Mike McKee, I'm pleased you gave us the global view. Thank you, sir, because I want to get to Mike Collins on this. Mike Collins, 7.5% CPI in the Eurozone, a deposit rate of negative 50 basis points. They're going to be doing QE through to Q3 if their guidance is anything to go by. What changes for you in Europe? You know, their, their GDP and their growth is slowing more quickly than ours, Jonathan, right? So I think the ECB has already kind of tipped their hand and indicated that they're going to focus probably a little more on the growth side of the equation than the inflation side. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed's in the same boat, right? At the end of the year, if inflation is still running at seven, but growth is tilting down toward one, what does the Fed do? in that world. I actually think that they probably start focusing a little more on the growth story and provide support. But for right now, I mean, they are singularly focused on inflation and they're going to run hot and they're going to keep hiking, right? I think there's a chance they do a hundred basis point, you know, hike in May and June. Why, why stop at 50, right? If you stop at 50, Jonathan, in, in May and, and June, by the end of July, when your third meeting comes up, you're averaging like a half a point of, of Fed funds rate for almost four months. Uh, between now and then, you know, why, why not get there sooner? Mike Collins, you don't get to say that and walk away. I've got 60 seconds left. You think they should go more than 50. Now, that, is that a should call or a will call? You think they will you know, or you they, think they, they should? They, they could. I mean, you know, their next meeting, May 4th, is, is a long time away, Jonathan. Uh, they have plenty of time to set up the markets uh, for a more aggressive hike. Like I said, their, their, their third meeting this, this year from, from now is, is not for four months. Right. So if they're doing 50 and 50, they're sitting here at, you know, half a percent funds rate on average uh, through most of the summer. Right. And and is that really where they want to be? You know, you saw Jeff Rosenberg this morning say, yeah, the Fed wants to get ahead of this. That is not getting ahead of it. Right. I mean, we're obviously we're, we're really short the front of the curve. So, you know, I'm talking to my book to some extent. But but, you know, I think they're going to ratchet up uh, the funds rate really aggressively here. And, and the curve's probably going to keep inverting. Well, at least you're open about talking your book. I appreciate that. Mike Collins. And a special thanks to Anastasia Amoroso, to you both. I appreciate it. Thank you. A really solid jobs report behind us in the United States. And off the back of that, yields higher materially by 11 basis points on a two-year at the moment to 244. On a 10-year, also at 244, up by around about 10 basis points. Joining us now on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. Secretary Walsh, what a jobs report. Just fantastic. Most people have come on the program this morning with Tom and myself and Lisa on Bloomberg Surveillance and on The Open have all said it looks great. What are you most enthused by looking at this? Well, I think one of the things that, that, that I like is we, we saw an increase in labor participation rate. So one thing we spoke about this morning, you know, a good you know, unemployment number low, a good strong report, good last three months report, actually a good last 11 months report, over 450,000 jobs. And we think about moving forward into 2022, you know, 1.6 million people still need to return back to the workforce. Uh, how do we get them, those folks back to work? How do we make sure that, that labor participation number goes up? Uh, certainly, there's still jobs open in the United States. That's one of the things. I'm not taking away from the report. I'm very excited about the report. But, but I think we, we're thinking about here, how do we move forward? The second thing is we're also looking at, you know, what, what can be done by Congress. We have the Bipartisan Innovation Act, uh, other known as the CHIPS Bill. That allows us opportunity for supply chain issues moving forward. Uh, we have some COVID relief money still uh, being talked about at Upper Capitol Hill. They need to pass that because we need to, we're watching, I'm seeing what's going on in China and parts of Europe with another variant going up. We want to make sure that we're prepared for that here in the United States. Uh, and then obviously inflation. We're working to, the president is, is, is very laser focused on bringing the cost down. Lots of challenges there. You were just talking about global challenges there yeah. that we have in other markets. You know, we have to, you know, con continue to work very closely on that. You know, the Fed Reserve, they're going to they're gonna take their action. I can't really comment on that. But we have to we have to make sure that in the short term we do everything we can to reduce those prices, but also long term that it doesn't happen again. A lot of what we're seeing with inflation is due to the pandemic. Obviously, what we're seeing with, with Putin and, and what he's doing with Ukraine, uh, but, but we also have to think long term, how do we prepare the country that we don't go through this again? Secretary Walsh, I've only got a few more minutes with you because I know you've got to do a range of interviews. You're a busy man this morning, so I'll whip through a couple of other issues. 
There is a labour contract covering about 22,000 West Coast dock workers at sites including Alley and Long Beach ports. That expires on July 1st. I know you're aware of that. I want you yeah. to help me understand what's the difference between those unions, those individuals behind those groups that represent them, using their leverage to secure better terms and exploiting the country's dependence on those ports. What's the difference? I don't think they'll do that. I mean, I was out in uh, Seattle and Tacoma, last, in Portland last week, specifically to talk to the company uh, and companies about, about the negotiation a little bit, about how they feel about it in the unions and, and express to both sides the importance of what we've gone through as a nation over the last 18 months with supply chain and challenges and still having ships out in the ocean, they, they all understand the importance of that. And, and I think the, the, I, don't, I don't see either side exploiting the situation we're living in for better wages. The contract will begin negotiation at some point in the next month or so. I believe that's when it, it'll start. Uh, they have to do some notification piece. But I'm going to monitor the situation very closely. Obviously, um, I want to make sure that, that we, we don't stop our ports. I mean, that the last thing we need in this country right now or in this world, quite honestly, Honestly, is shutting down other supply chain and creating other supply chain issues. Are you going to step in? If I need to, I will. I, I, I said to both sides. I mean, I don't think I have to step in at this point. Sure. If I did, I'd be having a very different conversation with you. But I think, you know, I, I feel good where the conversation is with the, with the sides right now. I think that they all understand the magnitude of this particular moment. This is unlike any other moment they've ever had when it comes to negotiations. Uh, still in, coming out of a pandemic and, you know, moving forward, all these issues around this. So I, I think they acknowledge very seriously the situation this country is in and, and quite honestly our supply chain is in. You've been to those ports. You travel a lot. I believe it's 60 cities in 30 states during your first year. You know where I'm going with this. You've also been really criticized because you've spent 162 days in Boston out of your first 284 days in office. Secretary Walsh, you know this comes up often when you and I talk. It keeps coming up. People keep talking to me about it. Yeah, Why is I that? Think it's What's a, in Boston? I, did, I think it's a ridiculous argument and a ridic ridiculous point that's being made. In the very beginning of me being Secretary of Labor, uh, we at the Department of Labor, where I'm standing in front of right now, nobody was in the office. We were shut down because of COVID-19. And I was doing my job. I was traveling around the country. Yeah. Some of those numbers, some of those numbers that are reported, I go home every weekend to Boston. I'm going to continue to go home to Boston every weekend because uh, I have a mother that's there and I have a family that's there, and I've made it very clear from the very beginning. So I think w w when 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 that article was written and that reporter put those facts in, she's incorporating the weekends into that. And if she took those out and actually did a, a, an accurate account of what happened, that would tell a very different story. Well, Secretary Walsh, I've got a mother in London. I've got to be in New York. It's what happens sometimes. People are basically asking why you haven't chosen to live in Washington, D.C. I, you know I, I, live in Wa I do live in Washington. I live in, Wa I'm in You've Washington. You've got a permanent I'm resident living... there now. You've got a permanent residence there in D.C. now. Just yes or no? I'm living out of a hotel. Okay. Secretary Walsh, it's... we've got to leave Thank it you. there. Thank you for being with us, sir, as always. From New York City, with your equity market doing okay, off the back of a pretty decent payrolls report, and don't ask me, that conversation keeps coming up with Secretary Walsh, and he's a very good man for responding to it. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.